Yell Hail and welcome to part 4 of the Celtic History podcast series, which charts the history of Celtic Football Club from 1887 to the current day. In part 3 of the series, titled Improvisation and Inspiration, Chris was joined by the green and white writer Paul Larkin, and they covered the period from 1920 to 1930. They continued to detail the struggle with Rangers as our side side neighbours began to rise in power and how Willie Maley maintained a challenge to them. The sectarian divide intensifies around this time, and the fight for independence in Ireland continues. Closer to home, there is the rise of Red Clydeside and social unrest as the country enters a state of recession after the end of the First World War. We are introduced to more tales on stars like Jimmy McStay, Tommy McNally and Patsy Gallagher, which leads on to an examination of a legend that was Jimmy McGrory. We also hear for the first time about the phenomenon that was John Thompson, and the boys then explore the famous Patsy Gallagher Scottish Cup final in 1925 and how his goal became one of the most celebrated in world football. We hear more about the development of Celtic Park as parts of the stadium and Celtic history are lost as a result of fire. There are more details of the hoops as well as the introduction of the away kit in the 1920s, mixed with more fan stories and confessions. There was ever an epitome on the field of the Celtic Football Club, it was probably Jimmy McGrory. Many of the pictures from the first 40 years of the club were stored and displayed within the pavilion. When the building caught fire, it spread so quickly that nothing could be saved. You had, you know, Patsy Gallagher, who, you know, fantastic Donny Goldman, a definite guy who could definitely be a good claim to be the greatest player that Celtic ever had at Celtic Park. You know, Patsy and, and Tony McNally and Jimmy Goodwin were all absolute Celtic through and through. The hoops were worn throughout this decade, along with the ever-present white shorts. It was during this decade that a lot of the sectarian strife yeah. started in Glasgow. Um, and certain supporters and people with kind of Irish origin and stuff were treated pretty shoddily. As the 1920s started to a disappointing conclusion, perhaps one man more than any gave us out hope for the future. And then, of course, in 1925, we had the famous Patsy Gallagher Cup final. That was the point where Patsy somersaulted into the net. Every Celtic supporter you talk to, every single one, has a story to tell. Why are you a Celtic fan? I became a Celtic fan in May 1967 at seven years of age. It was a struggle between the virtues, the improvisation and inspiration of Celtic and the organisation and method of Rangers. And I think that sums up perfectly the difference between Celtic and Rangers. Now we will join Chris McGuigan for part four of a ten-part series where he will cover the period of 1930 to 1940 with his guest in the Celtic Wiki, Mr. Tom Minogue. The Empire Exhibition came to Glasgow on the Clyde has hardly dried the sun, the land, and hearts were swept aside. And Everton, their hearts were broke as divers from and all. Sang Celtic first, and Celtic last, and Celtic over all. Chapter 4 if the 1920s had been the battleground in a fight for supremacy in Scottish football, then it was all too evident by the start of the next decade that there had emerged only one winner. At the climax of season 1929-30, Rangers had claimed their fourth successive championship and a second league in Scottish Cup double in three seasons. In stark contrast, the South had endured their third straight campaign without claiming a major honour. In the title race, the Hoops had finished a distant fourth, some 11 points behind the champions. It was hard for supporters of the famous Parkhead team to admit, a club which had dominated the opening decades of the century in such a thrilling fashion had now meekly surrendered their crown. Rangers, under the strict guidance of Bill Struth, had developed into a ruthless and relentless football force. Their strength and fitness was unrivalled. On and off the pitch, the club instilled among its players and followers a deep-rooted sense of their own supremacy. They may have lacked the excitement and attack and alacrity of the great Celtic sides of the past, but at Ibrox, success was essential, and style 
irrelevant. This determined professionalism of Rangers was not mirrored at Celtic Park. The Hoops' emergence as a football giant had been in no small part to the fierce ambition and foresight of the club's early stewards. How times had changed. The departure of men like Tommy McInally and Adam McLean, coupled with a shameful attempt to sell Jimmy McGrory, highlighted the lack of aspiration that typified the Parkhead boardroom of the 1920s. The boys, in a bid to save money, had even abandoned running their reserve team. The influence of a once inspirational Willie Maley was waning. The aging manager increasingly suffering from bouts of ill health. But despite it all, the Celtic faithful retained hope. At the start of his new decade, there was still talent at Parkhead, and in the great McGrory, the boys still possessed the greatest goal scorer in the game. With McGrory leading the attack, and young Scotland international Johnny Thompson guarding the goal, anything was possible. But no one could have predicted the triumphs and tragedies that was to follow. In season 1930-31, Celtic's league form was much improved, but they would trail Rangers once more, finishing runner-up, two points behind Struth's men. The Hoops good form was also evident in the Scottish Cup, as they hit 15 goals in an emphatic march to Hampden. On Saturday, April 11, 1931, Celtic and an impressive Motherwell side went head to head in the final. As 12 times winners, the boys certainly had cup tradition on their side. But despite making their cup final debut, it was the Steelmen, regarded as the best football inside in Scotland, who were most people's favourites. The Lanarkshire team settled quickly on a bumpy and fast surface, and within six minutes, had taken the lead. Boosted by this early opener, Motherwell continued to press forward, their slick passing game frequently leaving the Celtic defence in disarray. It was no surprise when well deservedly doubled their lead on 20 minutes. Celtic now had no option but to attack. The dominated possession appeared to lack the creativity to break down a stubborn defence. In contrast, Motherwell were content to play a containing game hitting their opponents with swift and incisive counter-attacks. But just as the match was entering its final stages, Celtic pressure at last caused some creaking of the well rearguard. The assured resistance of earlier was now replaced by desperate long punts out of play. There was just seven minutes left, and Celtic won a free kick on the edge of the area. With everyone expecting a shot on goal, Charlie Napier cleverly lobbed the ball over the wall, where the Irish McGrory stretched out his right leg and guided the ball into the net. Brushing off the congratulations of his teammates, McGrory collected the ball from the goal. As he raced back to his centre circle, the inspirational forward pointed up to the clock and the terracing. There was still time, there was still hope. Roared on by rejuvenated support, Celtic swamped the Motherwell defence now stricken by panic. With seconds remaining, a Johnny Thompson kick-out found Bertie Thompson out on the right wing. Bertie beat two men and sent a swirling high ball into the goal mouth. With the ever-alert McGrory lurking, Motherwell sent a half Alan Craig leapt high to clear, but the ball glanced off his forehead, past the stranded keeper and into the net. Celtic had equalised. The boys were ecstatic, Craig left in tears. The late comeback had floored Motherwell, and it was no surprise when Celtic deservedly won an entertaining replay, 4-2. The Scottish Cup would join the boys as Celtic embarked on their first tour of North America that summer. The sight of the famous hoops and the old trophy provoked joyous scenes among the thousands of exiled supporters who flocked to see their never-forgotten heroes. But while that summer tour sparked scenes of wild jubilation, events back in Scotland on September the 5th would leave a whole nation numb with grief. It was on that date, Celtic travelled to Ibrox for a league clash with Rangers. A crowd of 80,000 witnessed a goalless first half. Five minutes after the restart, the host launched an attack on their opponent's goal. 
ball was played into the area, where Johnny Thompson breaks from his line to bravely dive at the feet of the unrushing Sam English. Thwarting his opponent, John's head connected with the knee of the Rangers forward. As the ball rolled out of play, the young keeper lay still in the field. The concerned English and John's Celtic teammates were quickly called for help. Initially, the Rangers support heckled and booed the Celtic keeper. For those on the pitch, it was clear the situation was serious. As the home support continued with their catcalls, Rangers captain David Micklejohn went over to the crowd and urged them to be quiet. A hush fell over the stadium. His head wrapped in bandages, Johnny Thompson was carried from the silent park on a stretcher and taken to Glasgow's Victoria Hospital. It was there he would die later that evening. The funeral of Johnny Thompson took place on Wednesday, September the 9th. A short service in the garden of the Thompson home was followed by a burial at Bowhill Cemetery. An estimated 40,000 people lined the road between the Thompson home and his graveside. They climbed walls and sat high upon rooftops as John's teammates carried his coffin through the crowded streets. Nothing would deny the hot dog and Celtic support the chance to bid farewell to their beloved John. Two special trains had left Glasgow for Cardin Den that morning, but hundreds had walked from Glasgow to Fife, sleeping in fields just to be there on the day of the funeral. Johnny Thompson had been an incredible and precocious talent. Handsome yet humble, he was a goalkeeper of great athleticism and sublime grace. A hero for both club and country. His loss at just 22 years of age cast a shadow across a nation. Yet all too soon, there would be further loss and heartbreak for his teammates and friends. Later that very same month, popular inside forward Peter Scarf to kill during a game. Having struggled for breath during the opening period, Peter failed to come out from the second half. He would be diagnosed with tuberculosis. After two years of treatment, Peter would die at the age of 25. It is little surprise that such matters would impact on events on the pitch. Celtic's form dipped dramatically and they would end season 1931-32 trophyless as Motherwell finally ended Rangers run of league triumphs. Poor league form the following campaign would however be compensated for in the cup when McGrory grabbed the only goal of a Dara final as the boys delivered more hammed in agony than Motherwell. And Celtic last, and Celtic okay, welcome to chapter four of the Celtic History Podcast, where we're going to cover 1930 to 1940. And I'm absolutely delighted to say I have on the phone Tom Minogue from the Celtic Wiki. How are you, Tom? I'm fine, Chris. How are you? Oh, I'm absolutely loving life, Tom. Good. I'm loving this. So I am. Good. Especially when we come to a decade, Tom, where we've got conspiracy theories again, we've got one-off trophies, we've got tragedy, and we've got ecstasy. It's absolutely super, isn't it? We've got everything in this decade, that's for sure. The beauty about these podcasts is, you know, we can actually talk about the events that went on during these decades, rather than just tell the history. We'll tell the history as well, but actually to discuss some of the burning issues at the time and right from the offset in 1931 and we'll ring the conspiracy bell right away this week and we'll talk about a refereeing controversy that there was about a protest about the standard of refereeing by Celtic. Yes indeed Chris, this was a game in in the season 1930-31, it was a Glasgow Cup final and although Celtic won that game the refereeing was so bad that Celtic lodged a protest. And this was unusual, but it was more unusual because not only did they lodge a protest, as these things usually would be in confidence with the SFA, but in this instance, I mean, they went public. They published the letter. They went to the press and said, here's our letter of complaint. And it's not the first letter of complaint. We've won the game, but the referees allowed Charlie Napier 
and fans' favourite Bertie Thompson and Johnny Thompson to be kicked black and blue. There was a near riot in that game following a disallowed goal by the referee. The referee was a guy called Jai Thompson of Burnbank, Hamilton. And Celtic allowed this letter to be published. And it was it was scathing. And it was published in the, the Herald, the Glasgow Herald. And it named the Rangers player they were complaining about. And... As I say, it also said, named the Celtic players who'd been the victims of this uh, lack of protection from the referee. So it was a real biggie, Chris, and it was, it was in the strongest possible terms. And Tom, was this something that was building up, or was this just a one-off because of that game? No, it wasn't, and the letter made that clear, that this was not something that had just been building up. They said that they had been making similar complaints re- recently and frequently. So it was it was a biggie. And when you, you think about the style of the play at that time, I mean, we've talked about it in some of the earlier podcasts about the rough treatment that goalkeepers got, and we'll obviously come on to that in a, in a few minutes. But in a time when the game was obviously a, a lot rougher than what it is today, that was quite a stand that took it. That was, that was a, a very strong stand they took. And the referees, of course, they didn't take kindly to one of their own, this Jai Thompson of Burnbank, uh, being criticised publicly in this manner, and they demanded an apology. Now, there's no record that I can find of whether an apology was given, uh, and the matter just seems to dry up in the press there. But considering what happened subsequently in 1931 with John Thompson, you know, this is, this is dynamite. And the referee in question then didn't referee another Celtic game for the next 36 games. And he'd been a regular referee at Celtic games, and he didn't referee again until the following season. So it was, it was a big issue. And, as I say, published in the, the Herald. Can you imagine that now? <laughs> I can only dream of them doing that now. Yes, yes. You, well, uh, this is what I say, Chris. You know, the fans sometimes say, or the, the press rather sometimes say, that, you know, the clubs don't complain about referees. They've always been satisfied in the past. And here, right at the beginning of the 30s, you've got Celtic saying in the strongest possible terms, after a game they've won, that we ain't getting protection from the referees, and this isn't the first complaint. And that falls in nicely with what we've been talking about so far in the first 40 years of the history, where the style of Celtic was get the ball down, pass it, attack, attack, attack. And then, particularly in the last decade when I talked to Paul Larkin about the development of the style of Rangers, where it was organised, tough, brutal at times, this was probably the culmination of this. And here we have Celtic actually getting the stage where they had to complain to yeah, the authorities about the treatment they were getting. Yes, indeed. So yes, it was it was a it was a big event and uh, seems to have been lost. I, I, I didn't know about it until I did this this era for the wiki, and I couldn't believe it when I saw the the Herald article. And as I say, it named the three uh, suffering parties in the Celtic team. It was it was Charlie Napier on one wing, Bertie Thompson on the other, and John Thompson in goal. And they named the Rangers player, although that wasn't published in the, the Herald article. But it said that they had the, the, the copy of the letter which named the Rangers culprit. So right at the start of this era, uh, we were at odds with the referees. And when, when you look at that and the, the, the previous complaints, it makes you wonder if Celtic could have went on their tour as league and Scottish Cup winners because... I looked back then after I saw this this letter and there were some bizarre events previous to that that Celtic might have complained. And one of them was a game against Queen's Park at Hamden where Celtic were 3-2 up and the referee blew for time. Players trooped off and the linesman spoke to the referee as he's going off and called the the players back onto the pitch and said there was another two minutes to be played. <laughs> During which time the referee, Mr. Dugri, awarded Queen's Park a penalty and James B. McAlpine duly scored and levelled the scores. Well, 
You know, you could imagine that that would be one of the instances that Celtic have complained about. So complaining about referees didn't start with Hugh Dallas or any of the ones that went before him. So th this was timekeeping at its most creative, you could say. But that happened then. So Celtic may have went to the USA and Canada as league and cup winners, but they didn't. They got beat by two points. Rangers won the league, but... The refereeing decisions didn't start with Hugh Dallas or Bobby Davison or Tiny Wharton. They were going back right to then. So there you go, the conspiracy theories were right alive away, and well. Yeah. <laughs> with the stadium upgrades complete, the next few decades saw little change at Celtic Park. However, Celtic themselves were on the move more than ever before. Celtic left Scotland in 1931 and crossed the Atlantic Ocean for the first time, taking the team to the USA and Canada, where expatriates of both Ireland and Scotland could see how the two countries had united to form something wonderful. The team were even able to take the Scottish Cup across the ocean to prove just how successful they had been. The five-day sail was not a journey taken lightly. Although, on the way back to Glasgow, Jimmy McGrory took advantage of the time to stop off an island to get married. However, while fortunes originally favoured the team, they did not favour the masses. The depression of the early 1930s saw attendances dip, although that may have coincided with an unaccustomed dip in the team's fortunes. Fortunately, by the end of the decade, both team fortunes and attendances were soaring once more. 149,415 fans packed into Hampden Park to watch Scotland take on England in 1937. That very same year, Celtic played Aberdeen in the Scottish Cup final, where 146,433 spectators watched Celtic win 2-1. Both European records still stand today for international and club matches. Celtic Park's record attendance was also set in the New Year Derby of 1938, where 83,000 saw Rangers defeated 3-0. Some reports also suggest that attendance was as high as 92,000. 1937 also saw Celtic play an exhibition match against the Lennox Hospital 11 to mark the opening of a football pitch in the hospital's grounds in February of that year. Although not the first team, it did feature the likes of Matt Lynch and Johnny Divers. Little did they know that 70 years later, Celtic would be returning to those same grounds on a more permanent basis. Along the Gallagate from Celtic Park, Barrowland opened in 1934. Although destroyed by fire in 1958 and rebuilt in 1960, Barrowland was the leading dance hall in Scotland practically from its opening. It also doubled as an indoor marketplace at weekends, even spilling out into the streets surrounding the building. That market remains a famous part of Glasgow's East End, affectionately known as the Barras. 1938 saw the Empire Exhibition come to Glasgow. Centred around Bell Houston Park, it celebrated the British Empire on the 50th anniversary of another exhibition in Glasgow's Kelvin Grove area. Part of the celebrations included a football tournament consisting of eight teams from north and south of the border. Perhaps fittingly, it was the team celebrating their own 50th anniversary that came away with the prize. A trophy modelled on the Tate Tower, which was a centrepiece of the exhibition in Bella Houston Park. Standing at 300 feet tall and situated on top of a hill in the park, the gleaming tower with its three separate observation decks could be seen from 100 miles away. Sadly, Thomas S. Tate's tower remained a feature of Glasgow skyline for no more than a year. As a second World War loomed large, the orders were given to demolish the tower in July 1939. All that remains of the exhibition in 21st century Glasgow is the Palace of Art. Although the Palace of Engineering was dismantled and moved to Prestwick Airport to increase factory floor space during the war. That war would halt football and so many other aspects of life for much of the next decade. Fortunately however, the model of the tower that was football's prize can still be found in the boardroom of the team that won it. So we did then actually head off on a US tour 
a North American tour of Canada and the USA, and it was quite an eventful trip. Very, yeah. They, uh, they arrived a day late. The mayor of New York was waiting for them to give them a reception. A guy called Jimmy Walker, a uh, very colourful character, and they were a day late getting there. But they eventually got the reception, and uh, they, they had quite a stormy time of it in the States. It wasn't just all uh, sweetness and light. They, they played 13 games in all. They won nine, lost three, and drew one. But there was quite a lot of rough play, and some of the Celtic players were criticised. Charlie Napier was known in the press as a real shin buster, they called him. And you can't imagine it because the impression you get of Napier was as a sort of skillful ball player. But yeah, it was colourful times and I, I tried to put myself in the position of some of these young guys in America and it was prohibition at the time, so I would imagine people who liked a drink, like Bertie Thompson was known to like a drink, the great McGonagall, maybe Peter Scarf and Charlie Napier and these guys, I would reckon they would head for the speakeasies in New York, and I reckon there was about anywhere between 30 and 100,000 speakeasies in New York. And it was the time of Al Capone was trying to muscle in, uh, Dutch Schultz run the beer business, Legs Diamond was running bootleg liquor in New York. <laughs> so these were exciting times, and I can just imagine that team, or some of them anyway, having a rare old time in New York. It must be fantastic, too, to go and visit America at that time. As you say, you know, Al Capone in 1931 was just imprisoned for uh, tax evasion and stuff. Yeah. So the, the whole gangster thing was in full swing. It must be it, it was in full swing. There was a, an advert in one of the papers uh, where a Celtic match was covered, and it was an advert uh, for the paper. To have, they were having a campaign to stop gangsterism, and Prohibition had been running for about 12 years, and these gangsters had become really, really powerful, and they owned politicians, judges, and it was just about this time that the people had had enough. They were having huge mass meetings against gangsterism. Kids were getting killed in the crossfire. So, yeah, it was, it was right at the height of that that Celtic were playing. So it's, it's, it's a great time, but it was a hard time in America as well because we're 18 months into the Great Depression. People are suffering badly. Jobs are lost. And uh, it's, it's, it's real hardship. In fact, the mayor of Philadelphia, when Celtic went there, there's a famous picture of the mayor of Philadelphia, a guy called Harry A. Mackey, with Jimmy McStay in the Scottish Cup. And just prior to Celtic arriving, a few months earlier, Mayor Mackey had warned that there were a quarter of a million people in Philadelphia who were starving. And they might have to get the National Guard out the, the, the troopers out because he predicted there was going to be a breakdown in law and order because of this quarter of a million starving. And of course, we tend to think of America as the land of plenty, but at that time, it was a hard place to be. It was, the hungry 30s was right, right enough. Now, one, one of the things that jumps off the page at you when you look at the American tour of 1931 is the name of the teams that they played that were from America. Now, of course, you know, you, you had some, some look like amateur teams and the, the Bricklayers and Fall River, but there's a couple of big names jumps off the page at you. Uh, the New York Yankees. Yes. Who actually beat Celtic 4-3 at Fenway Park in Boston. That's correct. There was the yeah. New York Giants. Yep. Uh, Ulster United. Yes. Surely, surely soccer in America at that stage was a bit of a non-event, was it? Well, it was it was an experimental thing. I think the tour was experimental. Willie Mealy had it wasn't something that was just plucked out of the hat and they decided to go. Willie Mealy had went over with Tom Cogan ten years prior to the tour, and they'd sounded out the interest, obviously, and decided that yeah, there was plenty of interest there for them to go. 
But I suppose they couldn't have foreseen the Great Depression. But it had been a long time in the planning, and people were keen. The U.S. Football Association had tried to sponsor Celtic to go. But in the event, it was a guy called Sam Mark, who was the owner of the New York Yankees. He sponsored the, the tour for Celtic to come. So he was the guy who organized it. And the, the other little tidbit that is very interesting for the Celtic historians out there listening to this is that we play at a team called the Michigan All-Stars Yeah. on the 25th of June, and it was the first time that Celtic ever played under floodlights. That's, that's correct, yeah. So there was, a, there was a few firsts there as well. Oh, there was, there was a tour. few firsts, and I think Celtic underestimated what they were going to. Uh, that's the impression I get. Of course, I'm only getting impressions as I look at it. But I get the impression they thought they would be going out there and playing against really nobodies. But they were going out there and they were playing good footballers. They were playing against people who had been at the World Cup with the USA from all over Europe who had come to the melting pot. Uh, you know, teams like Hakua. Uh, the Jewish team made up mostly of Austrian, Hungarian Jews and a lot of uh, ex-Scottish and English players were out there who were no mugs. So there was a lot of good season pros they were up against. So they didn't get it all their own way. And I think that maybe surprised them a bit. Well, when you look at the results, they lost a few games. There was a couple yeah. of strolls in the park, of course there was. But they, uh, I say, they, they lost against the Yankees. Yeah. And they lost against Pawtucket Rangers. Yeah. And they lost and against be, Fall River. It would River. be the Rangers, wouldn't it? It would have to be the Rangers, and it would have to be the Yankees as well. But just to balance things up, just to, to, to let people know, they did play the Yankees twice and beat them the second time. They, they got one. their revenge, they did indeed. <laughs> just yeah. Celtic won on aggregate. <laughs> yes, that's right, that's right. And the, the, I think the, the real grudge game, the one that caused the most controversy, was the Hakua game where two players from each side were sent off. You know, it was a, it was a real... Uh, dirty game apparently so this wasn't friendlies as you as you would know them these the, the other teams had a point to prove as well and of course back to, to what we started with in, the, in this talk about American tour was it was the hungry 30s these these people they were playing against these guys were playing for their livelihood and they they couldn't be seen to be duds so they were giving it their best shot and that actually came to fruition um, after the, the, the tragedy of John Thompson because the goalkeeper that came in after John Thompson was Joe Kennaway, who was a Canadian. From, from Fall River. That's right. Who played against him at Fall River, yeah. And it had been said on the tour, if you read the, the tour books by McGrory and these people, that Joe, Ken, Joe Kennaway was the best player they'd played against. And, of course, Celtic had failed to score against them. But they only brought one player back with them, Celtic, and it was a guy called Jimmy Maguire. And uh, he went back, Mealy signed him, and he went back with them. But uh, he, he never did much at Celtic Park. But strangely enough, went on to become the head of the U.S. Football Association and a member of the FIFA a committee that organised, I think it was the 1974 World Cup. Oh, wow. So Jimmy Maguire went on to be a big shot in the game. So, yeah, they, they also met a lot of ex soccer players who had played in Scotland. So, yeah, a lot of interesting stuff there. And, you know, as I say, James Maguire, Jimmy Maguire had done well. He went right to the top. But you look at some of the players that played, and you've got other people who came from Scotland. There was a guy uh, from Clyde Bank, and uh, he just disappeared off the face of the earth. So, yeah, some did well, some didn't do well. The feds proclaim that law and order is prevailing in the long fight against organized crime. Testament to this is Al Scarface Capone, the infamous extortionist and murderer, who is currently sitting behind bars at Alcatraz, and has been so since 1931. Today's date, May the 23rd, 1934, will also go down in history 
as the bittersweet end to Bonnie and Clyde's outlandish spree of bank robbery. When we think back to the 30s, the one incident of the 30s that dwarfs everything else, of course, is the, the, the tragedy of John Thompson on the 5th of September, 1931. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, and I did the whole uh, decade for the Celtic Wiki, except, and, and, I, and I had entries in every game in that, and possibly two match reports for each game in that whole decade. And the one page I didn't have to touch was the John Thompson page because it was it was so comprehensively covered. And it's a strange thing that, you know, he caught the imagination, he crossed the divide, all the divides in Scotland that was quite divided on religious grounds at that time. He caught everybody's imagination and it was it got massive coverage in the in the press and it was it was just such a sad event and but funnily enough as i say i didn't have to touch it but i looked at the the game following his death when for the first time they ran out at celtic park after his death and that was very poignant but it was it was very simple and uh, the ceremony before it, it was just the Celtic team. I could, I could actually read to you what they said. It said, a, a, a small article the size of a big postage stamp, Chris, <laughs> and it says, an impressive tribute is headlined. Impressive tribute was paid to John Thompson at Celtic Park on Saturday. The flags were at half-mast, and all round the ground there was a subdued air. Celtic came out first filing slowly from the pavilion, followed by Queen's Park, the 22 players forming an unbroken line as they walked to the field and they took up their positions. All wore black armlets. The crowd did not know how to welcome the players. There was a moment's hesitation, and then a half-hearted cheer rippled round the field. Players and spectators stood while a lament, the last post, and lead kindly light were played. There was silence for a moment, then a cheer for the teams, and another for Faulkner as he ran towards the West goal. Then play began. Now, I can't help but contrast, that was it. That was all there was in the paper, the, the next home game after his death. This is a week after his death. And, and I just contrast that with today's press, which yeah. would have seen an eight-page pullout, live television coverage, but of course, death was it was it was treated differently back then, even as big an event as this. And strangely enough, on that day, there was another article in the the, the, the same Glasgow Herald, and it said it told of the worst mining accident, which has cast a gloom over the East Fife coal field, took place at the Wellesley Colliery, Denbeath, when two men were killed. There was a surge of roof, a big section of roof fell, and the two men were killed. And they came from that area. Now, that's where Johnny Thompson came from. That's mm -hmm. They signed him from the Wellesley Colliery. So he left that industry to get away from danger and went into danger. But it was an everyday occurrence in industry at that time. So, you know, there wasn't the sensationalism that you'd perhaps get today. Those few words to me in that article said as much, and there was a photo of the teams coming out with a black armband, mm -hmm. it said as much as all the hype you would get today with the eight-page bloat. Absolutely. Very, very powerful, wasn't it, Tom? Yeah. And the, the incident itself, um, when you look back on the, the, the history of the club, and we all know the story that John Thompson was coming out and dived at the feet of Sam English and stuff, and there's been books and there's been films and everything done about it. But when you go back and you, you actually read the aftermath of it, and you, when you do these podcasts and you listen to these podcasts and you hear about this young guy, you know, coming from, from, uh, from Fife 
up to Glasgow and you, you hear the, the, the stories about how, how good he was as a goalkeeper. It's only then that you start to think what a sad loss it was at the time. Yes, yes. I think I've, I've tried to analyse it and the, 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 I suppose there's a few reasons. The fact that his youth, the fact he was a clean living young man, he was a Christian man, uh, and just his sheer brilliance, yeah, that explains a lot of it. It, it doesn't answer all of my, I'm puzzled about it still a bit because the, the, the fans' favourite at that time wasn't so much John Thompson McGrory, although they were favourites, but the big favourite was Bertie Thompson. Mm-hmm. And when Bertie Thompson died, tragically, a few years later, he'd also been on the tour with John, of course, he had, John Thompson had 5,000 in his funeral, Bertie Thompson had 10,000. Mm-hmm. But he never captured the imagination of the press in the way that John did, because, well, Bertie was known to like a drink, and right. he, was, he wasn't the, the, the sort of exemplary role model, the ambassador that John Thompson was. But still, Tom, Bertie Thompson was only 30 years old when he died yes. in 1938. Yes. And uh, and we also lost Peter Scarf. Peter Scarf. So too. This American tour, and, and I, I got very close to the players, and obviously when you're reading a lot about them and writing up these reports and reading all the newspaper articles, you have your favourites, and, and my favourites were the bad boys. They were <laughs> Bertie Thompson, they were McGonagall, Scarf, maybe Willie Cook and Charlie Napier. They, you know, I, I, I read the articles about Jimmy McStay and, and Jimmy McGrory going to visit shrines, and, and these people were, were good people, great ambassadors for the club. But they weren't interesting, if you like. I like the boys <laughs> who were, were in the pun shops, and, and those four that I've mentioned, they were the people who were always in controversy. And, and Charlie Napier, he got involved in controversy with the, a dancing competition that he'd won in Canada, and he won a watch. So the, he was a flamboyant character, and he'd, the, the press wrote an article about him giving a, a beggar woman money and she said it was for medicine for her sick husband. And Charlie and the journalist who was writing the article had been in a pool hall when the woman had asked them, <laughs> and they followed her home to see if she was telling the truth, I suppose. And she stopped at a drugstore, bought medicine, and she stopped at a fruit shop, and they followed her to her house and knocked on the door, and sure enough, she was telling the truth, and her husband was in bed, and he was ill. <laughs> and in those days... You know, if you were ill, you, you you went by the board in that. It was a hard time if you didn't have money for the doctor's bills. So they then dib, dug deep and, and gave the woman some money. So nice stories like that you got. So you, you formed a liking with people. And as I say, Charlie won a watch for dancing and stuff like this. And, and Peter Scarf, he, when he was playing against Car Steel, I think it was, he the, he hadn't brought his strip, so he asked the guy in the crowd for a loan of a, a, a green dress shirt and played in that game and scored five goals wearing the dress shirt. So these were characters, and Betty Thompson, well, the stories about him are, are legion. He had his tap stopped on the way home, and uh, he was a sort of tragic figure. He, he had a lot of human failings, apparently, but... And, and that's one of the reasons they died so young, I think. But they were great characters, and, and, and you, you got a feel for them when you're reading all these articles. So that was it was very enjoyable for me to do this, because when I started this decade on the wiki, I, I looked at it and I thought it was a bit drab and boring. But as you did these match reports, and particularly in the United States, where the journalists were a bit more colourful and give you a bit more detail about them, then, then you, it put sort of flesh on the bones of the, the character and there's, there's a great photo of, of Bertie Thompson, McGonagall and Peter Scarf on the journey over I think on the ship and, and you could virtually smell the drink off the photo Chris you know <laughs> Bertie's in the middle and he's got a bonnet on and he's got a, a big cigar clamped between his teeth and McGonagall one side and Napier the other they've got straw boaters on and they've got the look on their face like they're men who have, have, have had one or two, you know. And they seem to be holding Bertie up in the middle. He's got a grip of both of them. And you can, you can see the character oozing out of them. And, and then subsequent events, when you read about McGonagall 
smashing the ball down on uh, McPhail's head at, at yep. Ibrox, and then walking off the park. You can, you can, you can, you can understand it because you've sort of seen the character of the guys from the photos and from the, the articles building up the picture of them. It's absolutely magnificent. See all these stories. This is what makes the legend. Absolutely, and. And the, the, the words that are associated with footballers, and it was Joe on the Celtic Wiki made comment about this as well, that you, you always seem to read the same words associated with with players. You've mentioned life with Johnny Thompson, you know, and uh, quiet with Johnny Thompson as well, but Peter Wilson, quiet, uh, Chick Geatons, you know, decent, honest, hard-working on the field. McGrory and McStay, devout men, and then, by contrast, you get the lively comments about some of the boys who were, you know, they were more red-blooded young men, shall we say, and uh, you, you, the, as you piece the story together, you see where it comes from, and it's not for nothing that the people who were sent off in America wear scarf. <laughs> Bertie Thompson, etc. It wouldn't be Alec Thompson because Alec Thompson was a quiet, sincere, genuine, quiet man who went about his work quietly. And so the, the, the descriptions you've got, the adjectives that describe these guys, once you get the bigger picture and look at all the photos, they make sense. But that, that's brilliant, Tom, so it is. Because even you think about the teams you watch today, you're still looking for, you know, the, the Cavaliers in there as well. You know, and probably one of the things that sets Celtic apart from a lot of teams is that they had characters. No yes. matter if their team on the pitch was rubbish, there was still the Charlie Tully there. Yes. You know, well. and, and these guys were absolutely worth the admittance fee on its own. We seek him here, we seek him there Never to find is very rare You can go to any single country in the world And you'll find dedicated followers A time when I've been behind the enemy lines One of them was at Tanadice uh, with it was the time that the, the old looked very steep terracing and the shed behind the goals and we had the other side, the uncovered side and the other side of the steep terracing. So I went in there a bit behind the goals and where the main stand is now, that corner down behind the goals at the shed had a load of Celtic fans in but I'd been in the turnstile with the other corner. So I tried to make my way through the Dundee United fans in that shed behind the goals and as I was edging my way through some big guy with a Dundee accent stepped in front of me and says, where do you think you're going? So I replied, eh, just over to see my dad. And then he supply, eh, said, so where do you live? I says, Dundee. He says, what street? So the only street I knew in Dundee was where our Wally and the Bruins came from. So I said, Glebe Street. Then I get the the big punch in the side of the face and started rolling in the terrace and a couple of them set up but that was interesting but I eventually made it over to the corner of the Celtic fans after much jostling and swinging the punches and stuff but uh, that was interesting Glasgow town is where he's bound to watch the famous hoops cos he's a dedicated follower of Celtic I went behind enemy lines uh, Tana Dice when we won the league from Jan, uh, Jan Venegor of Hess Link scored I think I obtained a ticket from a pub in Dundee proprietors, the boy from the Lockheed Club, I think, bought them. However, entering the stadium was a bit difficult when the MD without colours was approached by a steward or a police and asked, obviously, a trick question to find out if you're a genuine home supporter, like uh, who was a goalkeeper in Dundee United or what street do you stay in, what's your postcode uh, I managed to avoid them by the, the imaginary telephone conversation I just put the mobile phone to my ear and made my way straight to the, the turnstiles during the, the game we were sat two rows through the front one or two of the United supporters run about us without any Celtic supporters who reacted to any missed chances or the news coming in via radios from the, the game at Pataudry and when Aberdeen scored against Rangers that night and folk reacted, one or two get put out 
However, it was a different story at the full time whistle when the home support left the stadium and there was seemed to be several hundred had made their way into the away ends and the great celebrations that night. Well, the first the first game I went to see was in 1956, and our headmaster at the school I was at St Margaret's School, William Collins, was his name. He took us to see Celtic, and up to that point, I'd been an Aberdeen supporter because my friend was an Aberdeen fan. But we got marched along to the East End Park one Wednesday afternoon to see Celtic play Dunfermline, and. My memory of that is I can I didn't go to see Celtic play. I went to see Charlie Tully Celtic play. Yeah, yeah, uh huh. That's right. You know, as a that's young right. guy, that's and my memories of the game. I can remember a guy with red hair would have been Bobby Evans, but the person I was looking for was Charlie Tully taking a corner because it was legend. That's right. Uh huh. You, you wanted Charlie to put it in direct from a corner, so yeah. Legend is right, and 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 Willie Cook, the the, the the other guy I mentioned there, who went on to play for Everton, a great career with him. I read about him in, in the course of this thing, and in the Everton site, they said that his party piece was to put a half crown on his his foot and kick it as high up into the air as he could and get it to land in his top pocket. <laughs> It's style, isn't it? That's right. That's right. That's, that's right. I love those stories. I could listen to yeah. those all night long, Tom. Yeah, yeah. But even the, the, the controversy on the field was also reflected with a lot of controversy off the field too in the 30s because this was a, this was a decade where there was a lot of crowd trouble and trouble with the fans going to and from the games. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I think you've got to remember that this was a very troubled time in, in, in the world. And, you know, you had pogroms against... Jews and gypsies in, in Europe at the time. You had Japan invading China. You had the Ku Klux Klan were rampant in the States. And in Scotland, there was a, a, a serious move by the establishment via the Church of Scotland to send the Irish immigrants back to Ireland. So given that the government and the church were, were, were wanting to send us back, yes, there was an atmosphere of resentment against the Irish and Irish Catholics in particular who had came here for work. So against that background, yes, th- there was bound to be a lot of trouble. And but at that least was, they were wanting to lynch us, so it wasn't as bad as a Ku Klux Klan. They just wanted to send us back to Ireland, so I suppose we should count our blessings. And that was that was never more obvious than in 1933-34, whenever we played St Mirren. Yeah, yeah, this was the... The incident at uh, Brigton Station when fans were travelling on a, a special train to go to the Celtic game at Love Street and they were ambushed by the Billy Boys, by Billy Fullerton's gang at Brigton Tube Station and the, the initial newspaper said there was a gang of 50 but at the subsequent trial I think they put the figures up as high as about 200 had waited, it was a premeditated planned thing, they'd waited at Brigton Station and when the special train carrying the Celtic fans to the cup tie at St Mirren at Love Street had stopped to take on passengers, they just indiscriminately attacked anyone that was there and they were using axes a bayonet, knife, and there was a, there was a court case, and some of them were jailed. But of course, most of them would get away with it. But that was significant of the times. It wasn't typical, I would say, but it wasn't out of place at the times, and didn't get front page treatment at the times. You know, it wasn't a huge story, but it went on to a big trial, and some of them getting hard labour. The Billy Boys, of course. But yeah, that was that was of the times. And the the other thing about that about that decade was the early part of the decade, the first five years, if we're going to talk about what was going on back on the pitch, was yeah. far from impressive. And this was really the start of the demise of the success of the club. Well, obviously, there was a few exceptions along the way, but the team on the pitch throughout the 30s and into the 40s and the 50s, Celtic just wasn't the team that it was in the early part of the century. No, no, they, 
Uh, the, the, the period added in the decade of the 30s had won two leagues, uh, three Scottish Cups, and the Empire Exhibition Trophy, which was a one-off, certainly, but excluding Glasgow Cups, you know, that was a poor haul. And I look at the old firm game, the, the nerdy game, as a sort of, you know, gauge for success. And in that decade, Celtic only won the nerdy game once. Uh, so, you know, the, the Celtic fans would have been in, in in bad heart, I think, generally through that decade. Although, as you say, one or two great examples, the, the two Scottish Cups, the one in the early part, were really, if you read the reports, attributed to the Bertie Thompson. Uh, one was a replay, the first one. Uh, and then, of course, later on they won it again in, in the Aberdeen final. But it wasn't, no, it wasn't a successful period. And even to the point where the club brought back Jimmy McManamy as a coach to try mm-hmm. and improve the team on the pitch. And this was met with a, a huge hallelujah. But even yes. the legs of, of Napoleon coming back didn't have the effect that we were hoping for. Well, I, I think the, the, the problems weren't of co- coaching alone, I don't think. I don't think, regardless of how good Jimmy McMenemy was and how good he was at geeing people up uh, and, and getting them to play, Celtic were selling. They were, they were the, the biscuit tin mentality was on the go at that time. Uh, they were a selling club, and when you look at the players they got rid of, they could have possibly been not a good team at that time. They could have been a great team, but as soon as anybody had a value, they were they were off. They were sold on, and uh, I think that had something to do with it as well. We we're obviously talking about some of the stars at the time, and one of the things that we talked about just before we came on to record was the big names that were starting to shine in Glasgow, but were sold on to England for not fortunes? No, no. But I think it's, it's also worth mentioning as well, Chris, that it could have been a whole lot worse because in 1927, uh, Willie Mealy had twice tried to sell Jimmy McCrory to Arsenal and it was only the fact that McCrory loved Celtic so much that we hadn't lost him already sure. before uh-huh. we even got into the 30s. But into the 30s, people like Charlie Napier, Willie Buchan, Willie Fagan, Willie Cook, the O'Donnell brothers, Frank and Hugh, and of course Bertie, uh, they were all sold to English clubs. And and when I did my entries in the wiki, uh, I always tried to include some trivia, and that included wee snippets from England. So when I did the Celtic reports for the games in the 30s, I also looked at what the newspapers were saying about what was happening in England. And it was amazing how often it was that it was ex-Celtic players who were making the headlines. I mean, these players that I've mentioned, they didn't go, well, the exception of Bertie, maybe, who came back to Scottish football quickly, but the others, they didn't go down there and play bit parts. They went down there and starred. You know, all of those that I've mentioned, Napier, Buck and Willie Fagan, Willie Cook, Frank and Hugh O'Donnell, all played in FA Cup finals. Some got winners medals in cup finals. And they were in the top scorers. They were in the press all the time. I was seeing their names coming up all the time. And it brought it home to me that if they had stayed, just how valuable they could have been. But, of course, it's, it's, it's easy for us to judge from a distance. And was it Willie Maley or was it the board? You don't know the, the factors. But one thing for sure... They did get rid of a lot of good players, and eventually into the next decade, of course, Delaney. I think that the the biscuit mentality was well and truly to the fore at that time. Good evening, London. Welcome to 7 o'clock news on the 1st of September, 1939. I'm Wilfred Bumblescotch. Breaking news broadcast. Europe meets a fork of the road as Chamberlain's appeasement is broken by Hitler's iron will of malice. The House of Commons is truly stirred by Germany's forceful invasion of Poland. Unless Hitler accept a peaceful resolution, Britain could go to war. From 
1930 to 1940, the Celtic home shirt would change very little. Our green and white hoops were worn throughout this decade along with the ever-present white shorts. The only slight changes to the home kit were subtle differences added to the socks. In 1930 to 1932, we wore black socks with a white hoop at the top which was filled with small green diamonds. In late 1932, we wore black socks with two green hoops and a white hoop sandwiched in between the green hoops. From 1933 to 1936, green and white hoop socks were worn for the first time with the home kit. The white hoops were situated just below the knee, across the middle of the shin, and around the ankle. In 1936 to 1940, we seen a slight change to the home shirt with a white collar added along with a new style of socks. We still used the green and white hoop socks, but we dropped the middle hoop, leaving just the two white hoops in the socks one below the knee and one just across the ankle. From 1930 to 1933 our away kit was a green shirt with no collar. This was worn with white shorts and black socks with the two green hoops and the white hoops sandwiched in between the green hoops. In 1934 to 1935 we've seen the green away shirt change to include a white collar which was worn with white shorts. During this time we wore the same green and white hoop socks as a home kit. In 1935 to 1940, the only change to the away kit from the previous season was to swap the white shorts for black shorts. The surprising part about all that though, Tom, is that the crowds were still quite healthy in the 30s. It wasn't no, until no, no. The, the, you know, the, the 50s where we really saw a decline in the numbers. Yes, but I think the, the, the crowds for league games weren't always that good. And, and I think the crowds, they weren't kidded on by this. They knew what was going on and sometimes stayed away. And I think a, an example of that is when Willie Buchan went away. And Willie Buchan came back just the start of the war, and he played in a friendly against Hearts, and a game that would have at that time pulled 2,000. They reckon it drew 5,000, and that was attributable solely to Celtic fans wanting to see Willie Buchan in the Celtic jersey again. Mm -hmm. He was guesting for Celtic. So... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you would need to do a proper analysis on that, but I don't think the fans were kidded on by it. They weren't happy. Well, I'm probably going on cup final numbers sure. and stuff like that. The, the glamour games. That's all, a different thing. Yeah. yeah, that's a different story. But league games, well, for instance, in 35-36, when Celtic won the title, they, they, they won it in front of a crowd of 10,000 at Celtic Park. Wow. And... And bear in mind, that was the first title that they'd won in 10 years. That's right. And uh, McGrory wasn't playing, and that would have accounted for some of it. McGrory was injured. But at the next game, which was a nothing game, there was only one game to go in the season, uh, which was at Fur Hill, there was a crowd of 20,000 home to see McGrory beat the record of the Motherwell uh, who, the player who held it at the time. So... The crowds would come, but they were, they, were, they were particular. And, of course, in the 30s, there wouldn't be the money. They would have to be selective. But they could have attracted more if the, the personalities had stayed there, I'm sure. As I say, the, 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 the term fan's favourite is always allocated to Bertie. Mm -hmm. Bertie Thompson, Robert Austin Thompson. <laughs> He's the man who the fans loved. And, of course, they, he couldn't get on with Melee, and they shipped him out in 33. And that wouldn't be popular. When 10,000 turn up for your funeral, you're a popular man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that's, that's what Bertie got. And that was years after he'd finished playing for Celtic. But he was on his tombstone as Bertie of the Celtic. One little story during the 30s that's very good. We've, we've spoken a lot up till now in the previous chapters about history repeating itself and in case you didn't know this and it's probably not a very well known fact in 1936 our goalkeeper was James Foley yes. and he played in a reserve game at Tynecastle. I know all about it Chris he fascinated me this James Foley and 
when I, when I, when I put this on the Celtic wiki, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. This is history repeating itself. This is a red-headed, Irish, Celtic-playing Catholic being assaulted at Tyne Castle by a fan, <laughs> by, or by several fans. 1936. And, yeah. And for his trouble, for being assaulted, he is fined with, with an alternative of 20 days in prison. And at least, <laughs> at least Neil Lennon <laughs> didn't get uh, charged. Not yet. But, uh, <laughs> So there's progress of sorts in Edinburgh with the judiciary, but uh, it, it, it does make the mind boggle, and the circumstances were terrible. Foley had been getting called, and this is from the newspapers, of course, a Sinn Féin so-and-so, an Irish <laughs> so-and-so, a Fenian so-and-so, and he'd apparently kicked the ball. He said he kicked it to the wall to rebound off. But apparently it went into the crowd. There's no dispute that it never hurt or injured anybody. But that caused about five people to come on the park and assault Foley. And it was Foley that was charged. The fans ran off again and Foley was charged. And he went to Plymouth Argyle in the meantime. But he was brought back to court and... Whoever hired the, the, the King's Council, it was at that time, <laughs> they, they hired the top man, a guy called Duffus. And it went on and for quite a bit, but nevertheless, the sheriff, it wasn't a jury trial. Maybe that's, that's, that's the thing that, that's different from Neil Lennon. It wasn't a jury trial. The sheriff fined him and gave him an alternative of 20 days imprisonment. If Fantastic. it had been a jury trial, they might have hung him, you know? <laughs> I just thought that was a brilliant story that we need to bring out there. It was yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So, yeah. so moving on then throughout the decade, because we've still got the Empire Exhibition Cup to talk about. 1937 and the Scottish Cup final where Celtic beat Aberdeen 2-1 to one, yeah. is very significant as well in the not only the history of Celtic, not only the history of Scottish football, but in the history of world football. Yep. Record crowd. Record crowd, 147,365 yeah. is the official attendance that it was given. Fantastic, when you think, and uh, far too many to be in Hamden, that's for sure. Uh, I've been uh, in Hamden to see when Celtic played Leeds in the semi-final of the European Cup, and I was, it was the most frightening experience I've ever had. I was a smoker at that time, and, and I certainly never had a cigarette. My arms were down my side. I couldn't move the whole game. So <laughs> what it would have been like to have had 147,000 then, God alone knows. But, uh, yeah, they got away with it. But, uh, yeah, terrific game. And the, the, the final that day was probably won by Willie Buchan, who, uh, who played for Celtic at the time. And he was another one of these stars. That yes. was sold like three yes. months later to Blackpool for ten thousand pounds. Yes, indeed, it was Buckin. It was known as Buckin's final. Uh, he was got the, the newspaper reporters' man of the match, and uh, yeah, as soon as it was over, more or less, uh, and a price was on his head, they sold him. And Chick Geatons, he was another one who also got great billing there at that time. Geatons and, and particularly Buckin were the men of the match. And it was 2-1, and uh, a great game, apparently. Of course, Buchan got the winner. Uh, Johnny Crum scored the first in 11 minutes, and then Armstrong equalised a minute later for Aberdeen, and going to the, towards the end, Willie Buchan got it. But could you imagine being at, at, at Hamden Park with 147,000 people? Can't. I can't. As I say, Chris, I was. I think they put the, the crowd at the Leeds United game at something like 130, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't see you getting another uh, cigarette paper in that ground. But it just shows you how this football explosion had happened, you know, in between the two wars. Even though there was there was huge poverty at the time and austerity at the time, for 147,000 people to turn up in 1937. Remember, we're, we're only a year or so away from the war, the Second World War starting here, and everything that was going on, not only in, in, in Glasgow and Scotland and Britain, but in the world at the time, people still paid money to go and watch their football. Well, and, and perhaps it was because of the, 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 the sound of the war drums beating in events elsewhere in Europe. 
that people did want that diversion, a bit of escapism maybe to, you know, to get away from these things. And of course, the conditions in Scotland were, were, were very poor as well, and uh, wages were low, unemployment was high, and in fact they were reducing people's wages rather than giving them increases. So these were hard times. These were, you know, very hard times, and maybe people just wanted to sacrifice that extra bit and get to that game for a wee bit of escape from it all. From the SFA were playing to be seen They tried to take away a flag of orange, white and green The banner says, Sir Robert says, in answer to our call Said Celtic first and Celtic last and Celtic overall. Hope of more sustained success was short lived, as an inconsistent Celtic suffered two barren seasons. But a couple of new arrivals which would help change the immediate fortune of the team. In October 1934, Hoops legend Jimmy McMenemy returned to Parkhead as trainer. His arrival was followed in 1935 by that of English-born centre-half, Willie Lyon, signed from Queen's Park. The relaxed and married Madame McMenemy provided a welcome contrast to the discipline of Maley. Possessing an astute tactical mind, the new trainer would prove to be the perfect man to bring up the best from Parkhead's talented youngsters. On the pitch, Lyon added a stillness to the hoop's defence. Under the increasing influence of McMenemy, and with a platform of an assured rearguard, the Celtic attack blossomed. In season 1935-36, the experienced McGrory hit an incredible 50 goals, as Celtic romped to their first league title in a decade. The next campaign, Celtic would claim the Scottish Cup, and Willie Buchan and Johnny Crum inspired the hoops to a 2-1 victory over Aberdeen, before an incredible record crowd of 146,000. 433. The magnificent McGrory would retire at the end of the season, but with men like Crum, Buchan and Jimmy Delaney, there was hope the Celtic revival could continue into the club's golden jubilee year. This time, the hope was not misplaced. A wonderfully entertaining Celtic claimed the league flag of 1938 in emphatic style, but that fine triumph would not be the highlight of this landmark year. That summer would see Glasgow's Bella Houston Park play host to the Empire Exhibition. Costing £10 million to stage, the exhibition was intended as a spectacular showcase of the British Empire. It would also be used by Glasgow in a bid to attract new investors into a city hit hard by economic troubles. A magnificent 300 foot Art Deco tower was built on top of Bella Houston Hill. An impressive model of the Exhibition Tower, also known as Tate's Tower after its architect Thomas Tate, would be offered as a prize in a major football tournament to commemorate the event. The Empire Exhibition Trophy was effectively a British Championship, with the top clubs on both sides of the border invited to compete. All games would be played at Ibrox Park due to its proximity to the Exhibition site at Bella Houston. Celtic would line up with Rangers, Aberdeen, Hearts, Brentford, Everton, Chelsea and Sunderland. The boys would progress to a final with fine wins over Sunderland and Hearts. Only Everton now stood between the boys and the trophy, the Goodison Park Club having easily dismissed Rangers in their opening clash before edging out Aberdeen in a 3 2 thriller. So it was, on June the 20th, a crowd of 82,000. Packed into Ibrox, Celtic and Everton battled it out with the unofficial title of British champions. They were to witness an enthralling and tense 90 minutes. The game swung from end to end, providing much more entertainment than the 0 0 scoreline would suggest. Everton were a team packed with internationals and would go on to win England's championship, but they had met their match in a great Celtic side. Extra time would decide the victor and with Celtic taking a firm control of the game, Johnny Crum hit home the only goal of the match to 
claim the glory for the boys. Come dance the jig of joy behind the net, and at full time, the Celtic support celebrated a wonderful triumph with rousing choruses of patriotic Irish ballads. But before long, the songs would be silenced. The Empire Exhibition Trophy would be Celtic's last major honour of the decade, and in September 1939, the Scottish League and Cup would be suspended as the world once more was plunged into war. Tate's wonderful exhibition tower would be demolished amid fears it would act as a landmark for Nazi bombers. But for Celtic fans, the memories of great players would remain firmly intact. Rangers may have retained their status at the top of Scottish football during the 1930s, but supporters of the Hoops were not short of heroes either. Heroes like Johnny Crumb, a delightful centre forward who possessed swift feet and a quicker football brain. Men like the ever dependable George Patterson and Bobby Hogg. There was the noble Jimmy Delaney, an exciting old fashioned winger. Jimmy was not only blessed with pace and skill, but was as brave and hard working as anyone who ever stepped onto a football field. The young Delaney was a naturally shy character, but Jimmy McMenemy instilled in the player a just belief in his own talent. With a dashed ring in scintillating form, Celtic were a match for any team. With a cool head, wonderful control and fantastic vision, Malcolm McDonald possessed an all-round game that was virtually unrivalled by his peers. Quick and clever winger Frank Murphy was a superb cross for the ball, and the Celtic attack thrived in his excellent deliveries from the left flank. Coupling skill with a fierce battling quality, Bertie Thompson played the game in a style guaranteed to win the approval of the hoop support. Dazzling footwork made Charlie Napier a Celtic favourite, while the great Willie Lyon was widely regarded as one of the finest captains in the history of Celtic. A strong and tough tackling centre half, Lyon was an uncompromising defender who possessed a rare coolness under pressure. A brilliant inside forward, Willie Buckin had great vision drive and an ability to score vital goals. Canadian-born Joe Kennaway had the thankless task of being the long-term replacement for Johnny Thompson. You cannot replace the irreplaceable, but a fine keeper, Joe too would win a place in Celtic hearts. As war raged and an uncertain new decade loomed, football's importance was rightly diminished to an irrelevance. But with thousands of young men Heading off to the battlefield each week, Celtic fans could be forgiven for remembering back to the poignant message carried on a memorial card handed out by Willie Maley following the death of Johnny Thompson. It read simply, They never die who live in the hearts they leave behind. So here, here we were in 1937, we're, we're Scottish Cup winners, and then the next false dawn starts the year after, and in 1938, we of course won the Exhibition Cup. Yes, a, a great occasion that, but uh, yeah, and we were, I think we were fortunate when I look at this, and if you go back a season, it was... The practice then, it was an unofficial sort of tournament between the league winners in England and the league winners in Scotland played each other on a two-leg basis. And the year before, uh, of course, Celtic had been the, the champions and Sunderland were champions in England. So they met home and away and Celtic won both of those games. Mm-hmm. And But interestingly enough, in the first leg at Celtic Park, it was interesting in that both goalkeepers were keepers who had been signed to replace goalkeepers who had been killed on the pitch. Kennaway was the Sunderland one, and I think a guy called Mapson mm-hmm. was, was the, 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 the Sunderland one. He'd replaced a guy called Jimmy Thorpe, who had played against Chelsea at Roker Park, and with the rules in those days where you could kick the ball from the keeper's hands and pretty much do anything to a goalkeeper, he'd received terrible treatment the whole game and he didn't die that day, but he was taken to hospital and died some weeks later. And in fact, in 2011, when Chelsea played Sunderland, both keepers 
had black armbands on. Oh, wow. uh, it stood Celtic in good stead because they met Sunderland on the way to the final against Everton and uh, obviously they had the measure of Sunderland having played them twice recently. And it went to two games again, I think, with Sunderland in that that competition. And tell me this, Tom, the, the Exhibition Cup was by invite only, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, it was the, the, the top teams in England and, and Scotland. And uh, there was Hearts and Celtic and Hibs and Rangers and Everton, Sunderland. And it was one of those unfashionable teams in England, wasn't it? The, the one that Jerry McAloon played for Brentford. Right. And not not one of the big names that you would associate with the top ones, but at that time it was. So yeah, it was by invitation, and they, they, they had all the top teams. I don't think anybody would want Celtic to win something that was a tournament for the empire. <laughs> Much like the Coronation <laughs> Cup, and years later, and Victory in Europe Cup, he always won all these cups. The Empire That's Cup. Right. So against the odds, and just despite everybody, Celtic go and win it. And, and of course, one of our favourites was playing against them in the final, Willie Cook. He went to Everton, and he, he was a great success at Everton. In fact, I think he played over 200 games at Everton. And he went on to manage national sides. He managed Peru. He managed Iraq. He managed uh, Norwich City, I think. He managed uh, quite a few sides. So he was he was no slouch Willie Cook, but he was unlucky that day. He was on the wrong side in the <laughs> final against his old teammates. And the, the, the Empire Exhibition Cup, again, was a, should have been a springboard for Celtic to go on. Of course, the, the, the war then interrupted a lot of that. However, even that team at that stage, instead of building on the team, the team was starting to be dismantled after that final. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the Celtic way, I suppose. The, it, was, it was a great team. Kennyway, Hogg and Morrison, Geatons, Lyon and Patterson, Delaney and McDonald, Crum, Divers and Murphy. And, uh, yeah, Jimmy Delaney wouldn't last too long. And, yeah, it, it, it's sad that it always seems to be the way with Celtic. And it goes back again to what you were saying earlier on. The following year, you just knew there was something in the air because come the New Year's Day game, the usual happened. Yeah. Lost at Ibrox. Yep. Uh, they get beat by 2-1 by Rangers before a crowd of 120,000 or near as damn it. And there are 30,000 locked out. But uh, we, we, we were nowhere near Rangers in the league that year. We finished second to them and we were adrift by 11 points. We were dumped out of the Scottish Cup by Motherwell, so getting up towards 1940, we ain't looking good. We seek him here, we seek him there, never to find is very rare. You can go to single country in the world and you'll find dedicated followers My main one was Pinecastle, me and my good mate Eddie Hoy We went up there on the Saturday and the game got postponed or were we there? I don't think we were actually there on the Saturday but the game got postponed on the Saturday so we went up, we up in the car early on a Wednesday night and we still got the Gorgi Road end side at the time and we got a, a small bit of the main stand. So we were walking up and there's this wee guy there and they said they'd spare tickets but they were for the main stand, the hearts party. So he said 15 quid, so we've looked at it, it says 15 on it, so we gave the guy 15 quid. What we didn't realise, it said 3 o'clock on it. So what happened is these tickets uh, had been issued for the first game. I don't know if they were reissued or whatever but they must have got duplicates printed because it was a scam anyway but what happened is me and Eddie went round to the main stand so didn't have any colours on paid in or gave the tickets to get in their main stand so he was about 10 seats away from me and a couple of rows behind so I'm st- sitting in my seat and the guys came and sat next to me so the guys came and sat next to me with the hat scarf and the earphones and we turned around and said to him look mate is there any chance you could swap uh, tickets with my mate so that my mate can sit next to me and the boy to be fair is like that I know bother so he's took Eddie's ticket 
So me and Eddie are in these two seats sitting together and a bit edgy. The Celtic fans are over a bit and another bit. But there's a few tasty like Hearts fans coming planking their arses next to us. The next minute, we've looked around and seen the guy who we swapped tickets with getting questioned by a steward. So next thing, he's looking round to see if he can see who swapped his ticket with him. So me and Eddie have clocked this straight away and we've done a bolter up the back of the stand and we've went right over to where the Celtic fans were and climbed over a wee wall into them. So it was well oversubscribed this bit, but we told uh, some guys in it, so they let us go over and we squeezed up. Next thing, the guy's getting led out with stewards and he's pointing over to where we were sitting and he's explaining... There's two guys, I swapped my seat, so the guy at the Hearts fan get threw out, and me and Eddie were in the Hearts end, and I think they won, uh, they scored about four that night, and we were right up the back of that main stand, and the place was absolutely rocking, uh, on a Wednesday night. I can't mind the year, but it was in the 90s, and it was during the, uh, the Rotten Mobs 10 in a row, so it was one of the final seasons coming up to it for us to stop the, the, the 10, the, the Rotten Mobs 9 in a row, and it was for them, to, I, I don't think it was the season for them to go to 10, but my memory uh, playing tricks but it was definitely in the 90s and it was uh, a great experience and a Hearts fan got launched out of that expense <laughs> but uh, there you go Yes you'll find dedicated followers of Celtic Yeah you'll find dedicated followers of Celtic And that was the way the decade ended in a little bit of depression for not only you know the, the football team and the football club, but when you think the war was going on at the time, the decade ended in, in great, great travesty, didn't it? Yes, it did. And, and on the 1st of January 1940, we drew 1-1 at Ibrox with the Rangers. And it was originally scheduled for Park Headback game, but the SFA, under wartime regulations, which limited the crowd to 40,000, had decided that Ibrox was a safer venue. Nothing new there, make us play <laughs> Ibrox. And on the day that match was reported in the press after the, the Nerd Day game, Willie Maley announced his imminent retirement from football. And in the 1939-40 season, Celtic ended up 13th out of 16th. That's right. 16th team in the Western yeah. Regional Team League. Poor, poor show. And I think it's pretty much well recognised that Celtic just sort of closed up shop for the war. They weren't interested, whereas other teams tried to keep their team together and, and there was no uh, shortage of famous players wanting to play, you know, wartime uh, postings to Scotland who were were good footballers in their own right in England or wherever and who had in the past played for Celtic, such as the O'Donnell brothers, Buchan, guesting in Scotland, but they weren't guesting with Celtic. They mm -hmm. were invariably going out to other teams. So it just seems that Celtic shut up shop and just gave up any hope of maintaining a team and coming out the other side of this thing strong. That's how it seems to me, uh, and and others as well, I would say. And the, the chap I was researching that started me off on the wiki was was one such player, a guy called Hugh O'Neill. And, and I originally got into this wiki thing just out of interest in Hugh O'Neill, a man I knew and had been a Celtic player between 39 and 40 and he had signed on in 30 and then I'll, I'll, I'll look at all these match reports, he only played about 16 games and he never gets a bad report, in fact the opposite, he gets good write-ups and at the, the end of it all he's just told he can go, mm -hmm. Celtic weren't interested. And that again is a story that comes out again and again and again, right up to even modern day. But, you know, when you talk to some of the old players, including some of the Lions, a lot of players, and it seemed to be the Celtic way, uh, left the club and left a little bit disgruntled. Yes, yeah, and that, 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 that's sad. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's very sad. But yes, that is the case, that... For all the many wonderful things about our club, you know, we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is this lack of interest in, I think, the ethos of the club, something. That's the way I see it. 
Uh, but I'm not I'm not making the boots match. Perhaps they've got it right, and it's easy for us to criticise. There you go. But Tom, let me ask you one more question um, before we sign off on Chapter 4. 1938 was the 50th anniversary of the club. Was there anything special done to celebrate 50 years of being in business? Not that I'm aware of, and mm-hmm. I've put match reports in. I've read every newspaper, every Scottish newspaper, well, Herald and Scotsman, for every game that's, that's taken part in that era. Uh, and I've put the match reports online on the wiki for anyone to see. And the wiki's a great thing. I'll just plug that. And Joe Bloggs and the guys who run it have, have put far more into it than I ever will. But it's a great, you know, sort of a repository of all things Celtic. But I don't know of a 50th anniversary celebration of Celtic. Mm-hmm. And it may be this thing that they were formed in... 87, but started playing in 88, that makes the, the date a bit vague, but I'm not aware of anything, Chris. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Tom, to talk about the 30s, and you made a very relevant point at the beginning, when you started to think about the 30s, you thought, what the hell happened in the 30s? And like every decade so far, there was loads and loads of things that happened in the 30s, wasn't there? There, were, there was loads of things happening in the 30s, and, 30s and refereeing controversies were were still there and there's there's one incident that I thought was amusing and it was although the press when when I got a feel for the press of course looking at all these newspaper articles and putting them on the wiki and transcribing them often and there was a game at Parkhead in 1940 in April 1940 and it was an old firm game and a referee who would become infamous with Celtic a guy called Matthew Dale MC Dale he gave Celtic were winning one nothing, and he gave a penalty to Rangers when Alex Venters died. We know one near him, and fair play to Rex of the Sunday Mail. <laughs> he wrote that as an exposition of the histrionic arts, it was superb. And he went on, if there's such thing as a soft penalty, this one was seeping through the fingers. What is that? What is that? This, well, you would never get that written these days. That's brilliant, isn't it? You could, you could wax lyrically back there, and it was very poetic. Yes, indeed. It was all very Chumley Warner stuff, British party news, you know. The nicest way to call him a Dave and so and so. Yeah, 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 in a nice way. But it was so bad that even the, the very pro Rangers press, as it was in the 30s, they just had to, to comment on this. They couldn't let it go. Fantastic. Tom, that was absolutely brilliant. I thoroughly enjoyed that. So with that. Well, I've enjoyed speaking to you, Chris. Now, before you go, I'm going to ask you to nominate a charity that we will donate your portion of all the, the money's raised so far. And who would that be, Tom? It would be the Belfast Celtic, uh, Chris, uh, given the, the history that I've listened to with your, with your two-part podcast on that. Uh, it would certainly be them, and I'd want to do something. I mentioned earlier that my interest in Celtic was originally aroused by our headmaster at St. Margaret's, William Collins, taking the whole school to the game to see Celtic at East End Park. And I'd like to see if I can fix up something with Belfast Celtic and get a dozen lads over to a Celtic game, you know, maybe six from each community. And Whenever you say six from each community, you mean six from West Belfast and six from North Belfast, don't you? Well, well, well is that, I'm not familiar with Belfast, but that's what I mean, yeah. Any, anybody from Belfast would probably be chuckling at that right now, because yes, that, that, that's not what you meant. I've never had the pleasure of visiting that city, Chris. Well, Tom, what I will do is I will put you in contact with the Belfast Celtic Society guys, who I know very well, and uh, I'll let you talk to them, and you can work all that out, and we will make a donation to you, and you can see what you and can I'll, sort I'll take it from there. That's great, Chris. That's great. And, and thanks for having me on the programme. I've enjoyed it. And, you know, I'm grateful to the wiki as well for giving me a, a free reign to let me put my 1930s stuff online so that people coming along in the future can can have a wander through this, this era and they can maybe share some of the experiences of the guys in New York and read about the people, the bad bits as well, the people being attacked on the trains and the John Thompson thing. And 
it, it brings to life some of the sort of the, 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 the legends about the club. Absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully we're going to be adding a little bit of colour to some of the black and white photographs that you've enjoyed up to now. OK, Chris. Tom, that was absolutely marvellous. And I can't thank you and I can't thank the wiki <laughs> enough because without the wiki... You know, we wouldn't know half of the stuff that goes on. We, we would not indeed. It's a marvellous thing. And, and of all the, the football sites I've looked at, and I've looked at them, for, I don't just write about, I, I try to put a bit about opposition players and English players, and I've looked at all the websites, and the wiki is pretty much as good as any is and better than 90% of them. Tom and Oak, it's been an absolute pleasure. Nice speaking to you, Chris. Fantastic. Cheers now. There you are, folks. That's the end of chapter four. Absolutely fantastic again. Tom was magic, so he was. See, just to sit and talk to Tom. Ah, a pure delight. A pure delight. So thanks very much to Tom Minogue and Joe Blog City from the CelticWiki.com for making chapter four possible. But also special thanks to the Human Torpedo, Chris from the Paradise Report, Stuart from the CelticShirt.co.uk, Pat from Half the World Away podcast, Jason Higgins from Homeboys, Kelly from Stonehouse, The Wakes, Charlie and the Boys and Alison for the music, The Parrot and everybody that sent in their little sound bites. They are absolutely magic, so they are, and are able to break up the podcasts and keep your interest going. Our donations are starting to come along. After a wind last week, they're starting to pick up a little bit, but it's still not where we need to be. So if you've downloaded this, remember to go in to healhealmedia.com and make a donation. Just find the donation button. It's on the blog that accompanies the Celtic History Podcast and it's dead easy to find. And scroll down the page and you'll find the donate button where you need to pay by PayPal or any major credit card. 50p, a pound, five pound. Some people have sent us 20 pounds and I really can't thank everybody enough that have already donated. You're really going to make a difference. So come on, do what's right and send us a few quid and we'll donate all that money to charity at the end of the series. So let me give you that again, healhealmedia.com. Go in there and find the Celtic History Podcast and press the donate button. So next week we're going to cover 1940 to 1950. And again, it's one of those decades that people conveniently forget. But there was tons went on. Not only did we have the wartime when the leagues were suspended and Celtic had to play in a regional league, but also we had the victory in Europe Cup. We had players going away to the war. We had things that affected Celtic and Glasgow society during that period and it is absolutely compelling. I'll be joined by Marty Flynn from the Huddle Board and the Belfast Celtic Society to cover all that and if you listen to Marty and I walking around West Belfast doing the Belfast Celtic podcast you know Marty's a great colourful character and uh, no doubt will have loads and loads of anecdotes and things you hadn't heard before. I mean this is the period whenever Willie Mealy finally stands down and is replaced by Jimmy McStay and he in turn the end lasts throughout the war, and then the legend that is Jimmy McGrory takes over as manager. And it all makes for brilliant listening, and of course we'll have all the regulars in there as well. We'll also have a wee special feature on the next podcast as well, and we're going to start doing that from the decades moving forward. We've loads and loads of stuff recorded already. We've got player interviews to load in there, we've got different fan organisations in for a wee chat as well to talk about the development of how the supporters changed throughout the decades, and again all compelling listening. So once again, thanks to everybody for donating. You can go to healhealmedia.com and donate a few quid and let's raise some money for the charities. Remember also if you want to send your audio bites and you want to appear on the Celtic History Podcast it's easy as pie. Record yourself on your iPhone, your smartphone, your computer, your voice recorder. Get the file and email it to lostboys at gmail.com That's lostboys at gmail.com and remember the decades that are coming up. We've still to do the 60s. We've still to do Lisbon. And we've still to do the 70s and Kenny Dahl Gleish and the Quality Street Gang. We've got the 80s and the centenary year. We've got the 90s and where you were when the Rebels won. Then we've got Fergus and the Takeover. Oh my goodness. Get your audio bites in now and we'll put them on there. And they really are the thing that sets a podcast off. It's a fan's podcast, a fan's history of Celtic. So join in, because if you don't, you're going to regret it. Okay, you've been listening to the Celtic History Podcast. My name's Chris McGuigan. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Playing us out are your confessions. Talk to you all next week.
I'm Martin Kelly, now living in Melbourne, originally from uh, Glasgow, from Partick and from Govan Hill. 6-2 game uh, in, in Glasgow. I, I was actually back in Glasgow. My mum was ill and I had a hell of a month. And for two hours during that month, I was in sheer ecstasy watching Celtic smash Rangers 6-2. Yeah, Charlie Nicholas. I uh, I lived in Mary Hill. In fact, I lived in the same uh, estate as Charlie Nicholas, um, though he was obviously quite a bit older than me. But when Charlie left, it it broke my heart. I am Chris McMoneagle. I am currently living on the Gold Coast in Australia, uh, which is about an hour south of Brisbane. Uh, I am basically originate from the south side of Glasgow. It was the first time I came to live in Australia. I remember watching Celtic game thinking is this the last time I'm ever going to be at Celtic Park and it happened again two years ago when I went back to Scotland and it was at Celtic Inverness game and again the same thoughts went through my head you know having been there all this time is this going to be the last time I'll ever be at Celtic Park so I am Jim Kinlan I'm originally from East School Bride but I left East School Bride in 1984 so I've been about 30 years uh, since I left, I now live in Sydney, Australia. I left Scotland in December '84. I never ever went back to Scotland. I came to Australia 20 years ago, but I was left Scotland in December '84. My last game, my last big game I seen was in October '84, and it was the Rapid Vienna game where we won three nothing. And then you know there was a thing about them both winning the pitch and all that rubbish. But I was there with a girl, and she was a Celtic. She was a Celtic support. She was at my school, and, and she was bloody hot to look at and we went to the game together and I remember when it was 2 nothing up she was a mad Celtic supporter and when we went 2 nothing up and we were, we were on the, the away goals at that time and I was thinking oh please score if we score here and I wasn't thinking about the game I was just thinking if we score I'm going to get my leg over and that was, that's probably the biggest confession I can make I remember being at that big big game and really no caring about the result just as long as we got through so I'd have my fun times afterwards <laughs>